Welcome everyone to CTA's Innovation Policy Day today here at South By. Our next panel discussion is titled, Building a 21st Century Workforce. Today I am so pleased to moderate and lead this discussion with tech industry leaders and they're gonna showcase how specifically they're contributing to helping prepare both Americans and communities all across this country, prepare for skilled jobs for today and tomorrow. So please join me in welcoming Kelly Jordan. She's the director of IBM Career and um, Skills at IBM. And we have, I'm not doing this in order, <laughs> Tyra Mariani, president and COO of an organization called New America. Can't wait for you guys to learn more about them. Kate Sheeran, public policy manager from Google. And last but not least, Sean Thurman, director of global public policy from Walmart. So uh, th please join me in thanking them, or welcoming them. <laughs> So before we get started, um, I want to provide a little bit of backdrop and, and provide some context. I am sure everyone in this room has read in the news and observed that communities um, all around our country are experiencing an unprecedented skills gap. Uh, we have record low unemployments. We haven't seen this in over 50 years, um, less than 4%. But while that sounds like good news, uh, we still have over 6 million Americans unemployed and many others underemployed. So um, we need to do something about this. And, and here's the good news of, uh, side of the story. We have 7 million open jobs and the number continues to grow. Last year, we were adding over 200,000 jobs a month to um, our economy. And here's the, the good news that we're gonna talk about today companies, especially in the tech sector, are organizing themselves and, and investing in, in, um, in existing employees, upskilling and training them, but also in future, in our future workers. So organizations like <laughs> IBM, Google, Walmart, and New America are doing incredible, impactful things to close this gap, and we're gonna talk about those today. The other theme that you're gonna see is that there is not a one-size-fits-all approach. It is absolutely imperative that key stakeholders work together, and those stakeholders include our federal, state, and local governments, businesses themselves, community leaders and residents, philanthropic groups, i.e. Boys and Girls Club of America and, and, and whatnot, and um, educational institutions. So you're gonna see and hear a lot about that collaboration. So with that, let's get started. Um, what I want to first do is just ask some general questions and then we're going to uh, jump into um, understanding what each of these companies are doing. Um, let me just toss out a question and whoever wants to answer it first, uh, ch chime in. Um, how would you define the future of work? When people come up to you and say, what does the future of work, work look like? How do you answer that? I can Anyone? jump in. Yeah. Um, so I always think the term future of work is misleading because we're not actually like talking about some unforeseeable future 20 years from now that we have to prepare for. We're talking about jobs today, right? How do people get fulfilling high quality jobs today? How do they get access to education that, help will, that will help them grow their skills? How do we make sure they have economic security? And so sometimes we get caught up in this like, what will the future look like? And then we think like, oh, is it just like a world where everyone works in tech and has computer science degrees? And I think that we can all agree that that's not true. And so we have to think about it now. We also, we have to prepare for the future, whatever that looks like, but there are things to do now to help people get into good jobs. I also think about it as the changing nature of work. Yeah. Like, what are we working on? How do we envision how jobs and what we're working on will change in the future? And just, we can't imagine that because we couldn't imagine some of what exists today. But how do we think about what could happen and how we're prepared for it? So changing the mindset of work. I mean, it's like going to work every day and recognizing that I'm going to have to learn new skills, even if it's you know, in my role, software applications for how to do things internally. Well, well every job is going to change. Yeah. AI is changing jobs, period, 100% of them. Some jobs may go away. We have brand new jobs that may emerge, but the function of an existing job may also shift and pivot. We talk a lot about the half-life of skills as well. A skill that you may have today is potentially not going to be relevant five years from now. 
So to me, when I think about the work that we're looking at for workers, for anybody, you've got to be a continuous learner. You've got to be continually looking for new things that you can do, new skills that you can build. Because if you aren't, you're going to quickly find yourself mm -hmm. not with the right skills for the jobs that are available. I like that phrase, half yeah. life. And I, and I think that what we're seeing now, you know, when we, when we first started looking at the issues around future of work, we were discussing them in a slightly different sense of how we were dealing with workforce development issues. And we came to the realization that these things, are, these things overlap and a lot of the same things that we were working on long term are merely, uh, the challenges are merely enhanced by the fact that technology is changing, that our industry is changing really fast as well. And so um, being able to just kind of look at it and be like, th this is the same workforce uh, issue that we're, we've been facing before, but it just got a lot more difficult to, to tackle. So. Got it. Um, from your perspective, um, all of you, um, what are the positions that you're finding difficult to fill? And Tyra, from your perspective, you know, your clients or, or, or whatnot. Yeah, so, there, so I'll answer that two part. When I think about New America as an organization, we are not, we have come a long way in terms of our diversity, but we are not at all where we need to be. And so we've, and I'm, I'll give a couple of examples because I think they're relevant. We've also looked at what our hiring practices are that are excluding a more diverse workforce. So some of it's looking at, we literally just did a training last week on implicit bias to talk about what that even is, how it enters the workplace, how do we create a more inclusive workplace. But then we also realized, for example, when we offer internships, we developed a policy that everyone should be paid. Because to come to DC, people are often taking out loans, or it's someone with a more affluent background who can afford to take a sort of policy role in DC. So we said, no, we will start to offer income that allows for a group, you know, more inclusive group of people <laughs> that we really attract smart. to the place. So some of it's looking at what, it's, what is our culture like, but then also what are our hiring practices that are keeping out the people that, that we want to be a part of what we envision the, the new America should be looking like and what new America is becoming. I totally agree with that step. I also think that sometimes when we have these conversations, we focus on like what the worker needs to do, what the student needs to do, but employers need to do a better job at talking about what skills they're looking for. Like not just a job title and a little random description <laughs> yeah. you read online, right? Like no one actually learns anything from that. Like employers need to describe like what skills, either digital skills, soft skills, um, the competencies. The competencies mm -hmm. they need, right? And also be willing to kind of look in places that they haven't been looking in the past, right? Um, I think we heard like two panels ago about this. Like, look outside of your normal circle. Um, there are talented people all across the United States, and like we can find them, but we just have to take the effort to explain what we're looking for, to like know what we're looking for, and then find them. Yeah, it's, it's in my job title, New Collar. Um, that's a phrase that we coined at IBM that really talks about the types of jobs that exist between white collar and blue collar. They're roles that require skill but don't necessarily require a degree. So we don't care where you earned that skill. It could be in a four-year institution, it could be at a community college, it could be at a boot camp, you could be self-taught. Um, but that's been, I think, a big pivot point for us at IBM is to really start to talk about skills and not use that piece of paper as a barometer of somebody's success and capability to do a job. That's what, a what, I was just going to say what we see happening in the labor market is I, I often use this example from a, a former experience of administrative assistance where it's something like 70 percent of job descriptions would require a bachelor's degree yet only 30 percent of existing administrative assistants have a bachelor's degree which means the people that are actually doing the jobs right now can't apply for the jobs that are being posted. And so we have this sort of stuckness and stagnation in the market that we really do need to expand what, what skills are really yeah. needed in order to hire folks. And that's why I, I remember reading a few months back, um, it was something like 13 major uh, companies um, have dropped that four-year requirement across the board. I think, I know Google and IBM are definitely on there. Can't remember if Walmart is, but they probably are. So just dropping that as a, um, as a requirement, because it's almost like a barrier of, of entry for, for many. Yeah, I mean, from a, from a store standpoint, we're, we've, we've always been, uh, you know, provided low barriers to entry. 
um, and we say that we like to you know hire hire for attitude and train for skill oh, and like be able to let uh, let prospective applicants know here's here's what awaits you once you start at Walmart we'll be able to get you on to a training track we don't want you to stay in that first job but we want to be able to provide that to you and that's sort of like the big macro scale workforce things that we're doing but we're also focusing um, on on small scale uh, experiments especially as we get more into what we call omni-channel which is sort of serving um, both physical and digital retail together mm things like online grocery, things like that. So we are, you know, as we continue to develop towards being more of a tech company, we have been looking at opportunities like, um, uh, uh, we did a pilot out in California uh, with uh, an organization called Path Forward where we uh, created what were called returnships um, and basically giving opportunities for 16-week uh, paid internships for experienced professionals who have about five years of experience but have spent two years or more outside of the workforce due to caregiving. And so in terms of looking in places where, um, where, where you haven't looked before, that's, that's certainly been a great example. We had about 30 people in that pilot and 23 of them were offered positions. None of them declined them. A couple of them actually went over and worked for contractors. So mm -hmm. um, certainly, you know, provide some promise there. And something That's like, fantastic. Yeah. Love the word omni-channel and return <laughs> Those are, and half-life. Loving those. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do now is just go and have a little deep dive conversation with each one of our guests here today. Uh, let's start with Kelly. Kelly, you talked a little bit about this new collar worker. Um, this is a, a term that is very important to their CEO, Ginny Rometty. Kelly just described it, the new collar worker uh, is someone who isn't necessarily a white collar worker or has a blue collar trade. Um, it's, it's individuals that can contribute and work in meaningful tech related jobs or other jobs um, and can enter in a new, um, a new um, educational pathways. And what's really fantastic about these is it um, provides more opportunity for many who have been overlooked. Um, in, in our workforce. So, Kelly, can you just tell us a little bit of, about why this new collar role was so important to IBM? Why was it a business imperative that you create opportunities for these new collar workers? And, um, and then how are you delivering on that? Sure. Well, you talked a little bit about the landscape already. Um, one of the things that we kind of got really concerned about, I would say, is the fact that there's over 500,000 open IT jobs. And when you look at the volume of students that are coming out of four-year universities, I think it's something like 60,000 computer science graduates each year. So there's this really large imbalance when you talk about supply and demand. Um, and so for us, that means hiring has gotten very competitive. I'm sure many of you are seeing that as well. Um, and so we felt like we needed to really come up with a way to open the aperture on candidates that we're looking at. So we started to redefine what that meant in terms of jobs, this idea that you need a skill, not necessarily a degree. And then we started to think about new ways of bringing in candidates, whether that was uh, stepping up our recruiting from community colleges, starting to connect more with boot camps and other educational providers, and really becoming more inclusive and open about the types of candidates that we're bringing in. It wasn't just the same business as usual. Mm -hmm. And not calling on the same universities, Correct. et cetera. I love it. So, Tell us about your apprenticeship program because that is a perfect example of how you have collaborated with educators or education institutions, leveraging your own training tools, working yeah. with community college boot, camp or camp boot camps to offer apprenticeships. Uh, so we launched in October of 2017 a Department of Labor registered apprenticeship program. And the reason we thought about apprenticeship as a pathway in is that we saw it sort of as a bridge between you know, that, that learning and that skill that somebody has built, but really that opportunity to provide experience and hands-on learning. So we worked with the Department of Labor, built a registered program, and you don't have to build a registered program, but we chose to because it gave us really a level of standard around the type of rigor we wanted to put into this. We started with three job roles and six apprentices, and I kind of got a little aggressive and said, oh, I'd love to do 100 in 2018. <laughs> We did 200. <laughs> uh, we really saw just amazing adoption across our company. It's becoming a legitimate talent solution for us, right? These are for roles that we are finding to be very, very competitive in our hiring. 
Um, so we're losing candidates just because they're getting multiple offers from, from multiple companies. There are also roles where we may have a retiring workforce. Um, so we're using apprenticeship as really this way of doing knowledge transfer uh, for roles that we may be losing skilled IBMers to. Where um, our biggest, I think, role is software engineer. We've also got apprenticeships in cybersecurity, in data science, in design. And then we're also doing them in slightly more traditional roles, lab <coughs> technicians, hardware technicians, and mainframe. So we're seeing the ability to really create this learning experience for pretty much any type of role at IBM. It's competency-based, so apprentices can master these competencies at their own pace and speed to demonstrate their proficiency. It's got about 300 hours of learning on average over the course of that apprenticeship. Most of them are about 12 months in length. Um, we've graduated, I think, about 20 so far. Um, and our plan for 2019, because I like to set crazy goals, uh, is now 450. Yep. <laughs> so um, we are on a path to that, and we've got some great work that we're yeah. doing with CTA as well around the apprenticeship space. That's great, Kelly. So just a couple of things. Um, IBM rolled out this apprenticeship program for themselves. If you look at the Department of Labor, less than 0.02% of apprentices of uh, programs are in IT-related roles. That's extremely low. This is a huge, there's a huge opportunity to make a shift there. And um, our Department of Labor, uh, uh, Secretary Acosta is, and, and the administration is working very hard to make it easier for businesses to offer apprenticeship programs. So um, IBM approached us at CTA, the US jobs team, which I uh, lead, and said, hey, let's create an apprenticeship coalition, which we have. And we are um, about 20 plus members strong. And IBM is um, going to help and inform these other member companies about how to build a program from the ground up and share their assets. So we're re really excited about that. Um, and anyone who's a CTA member who would like to join, you're more than welcome to. You can speak to me about that afterwards. So. Um, Thanks, Kelly. That's great. Um, oh, and I want to just say I had the pleasure of meeting five of these apprentices, and they are phenomenal. And one of the benefits of, of, um, of offering apprenticeships is they're very loyal to the companies that have given them that opportunity. So they are very loyal. The five that you met, I think, are just a great example of this idea of inclusion. Um, we had a former firefighter who had hurt his back, and he couldn't be a firefighter anymore. He's a software engineer apprentice. Um, a barista in our lobby Starbucks, had a high school degree, was really interested in starting to learn to code, had connected with IBMers, was getting mentorship, and actually is now an apprentice in the same building he was serving us coffee yeah. six months ago. Um, so really, candidates that never would have been on our, our radar before who are coming in and having this amazing yep. impact. And then two others. One is a dreamer who completed the P-Tech program up in New York, and another one is a writer. She graduated from Mizzou, wants to be a writer, but also wants to, hasn't been able to immediately generate an income right. from that right away. So um, thank you for and all And Jennifer, that. if I yes. may underscore just the points that you all are raising, which is that apprenticeships are really good for everyone. They They're are. good for mm -hmm. the individual because it gives them relevant experience. Hopefully it helps them to further their you know, higher education. It's great for employers because they are hiring them. They've got a source of talent they've been invested in. It's just overall good for the community. Yes. And so you wonder, why are there only a half million active apprentices right. in the country? Yeah. It's so small when it's such a win for everyone. It's, and it's that's, unfortunate. that's what we're hoping to, I think, change with this coalition. Um, we, we kind of struggled a bit as we set up the program. There wasn't a lot of guidance out there around how to do this in tech, how to do it at scale, a company the size of IBM. And so we want to share our learnings because while we're making this impact, it's, it's 200 people, it's 400 people. If we really want to change how the workforce and the economy is looking in America, it's got to be all companies. Yep. And so we're hoping to help all of these other partners get that step yeah. up the ladder. <laughs> Good. <laughs> awesome. Thanks again. So Kate, let's talk to you a little bit about Google. So I know when I'm driving around in Northern Virginia, uh, I listen to the radio a lot, and I'm hearing these ads from Google and their IT training program. So um, I call it the Grow with Google program. Not sure if that's the right phrase. But um, Kate, tell us about what the program is and why did Google launch it? So Grow with Google is our kind of wide initiative to bring digital skills, trainings, demos, um, courses to local communities all over the US. We just announced recently that we're going to go to libraries in all 50 states. 
um, just to bring people the skills and trainings they need in their hometowns, right? This isn't just about like the big tech hubs in America. These jobs are everywhere. Um, and as part of that work, we started something that we call the IT Professional Support Certificate. And this was an area, like I said, we had this gap in our workforce. There are 150,000 open IT support jobs in the US at tech companies, but also at non-tech companies. Yeah. Um, and we felt this crunch. We, like, we couldn't hire people for these roles, and we're Google. And so we thought, like, if we're having this problem, other people are having it too. Um, and we realized that those jobs didn't really need a bachelor's degree. They didn't need computer science training, right? It was just a whole different skill set, and there wasn't really a way for people to be attaining that skill set and for us to know that they had it. So we started this program, and it basically brings beginning lear learners into an entry-level IT support skill set. Um, it's around eight months part-time, and we wanted to make it as widely available as we could. So we partnered with Coursera and 25 community colleges to make this available in communities all around America. Um, but we didn't want it to just be a credential that like Google recognized and like we could hire, and this was really important to us. And it goes, it speaks to this, like how can we create programs that scale, programs that work across the economy, programs that work for all companies. And so on its launch, we partnered with 20 other big employers who are recognizing this credential, this certificate, um, and are looking to hire people who are completing the program. And so that was a way that we could translate the, the issues that we were having with our own hiring into like a larger way to kind of benefit people looking to upskill or looking for a change in career. I, I see a similar theme here with you and IBM is that by providing this training too in your apprenticeship program, it also um, benefits um, other companies and you're willing to do that because yeah. it's that rising tide raise it's right. all boats and like so. I don't think any company right no company is going to sit up here and be like we're going to hire every single worker in America but we all are invested in making sure that there's like opportunity for people mm -hmm. everywhere and so we need to make programs that work for us and work for our hiring mm -hmm. but we need to think outside of just like the scope of our own exactly company. yep especially the small businesses that are in you know, across, sprinkled all over our country. Yeah, that's right. Um, what is, is Google doing anything um, with the K through 12 uh, market and, and what are you doing there to help them prepare for jobs of the future? Yeah, we've been kind of doing uh, work in the K through 12 space for quite a while. Um, the traditional computer science education programs that a lot of tech companies are doing, making sure the students have access to CS programs. We have one that we call CS First that is a curriculum that anyone can teach to either in the classroom or in after school programs. It's just a really hands-on basic way to learn coding using Scratch. Um, and I believe like a million students, teachers, and parents have used that curriculum, which is really amazing. Um, we also know that it's not just about CS, it's about d digital skills, right? No matter what kind of right. job you're going to be in in the future, you need to know basic digital skills. And we felt like there was a need for some like new information, new curriculum out there. And so we started a program called Applied Digital Skills, which allows students to learn digital skills in the context of things that they're going to see in their everyday life. So how do you build a resume, but do it online and make it so that you can apply for jobs online? Um, how do you plan your budget? Um, and then you use technology to help you solve those challenges. So you're b learning both like, life skills yeah, and nice. also digital literacy skills. So you're not just learning how to code for the yeah. sake of code, like I did. I would like use basic and just run dot matrix images yeah. on my printer and like, back in the age. That's yeah. what I did. And it's fun to build those apps of like a cat meowing yeah. or whatever, but, but there's more, more to jobs in tech than just that. Right. That's great. Um, and I think that the last thing I just wanted to mention in the K through 12 space is that there are some challenges that schools are facing around access, and we can't ignore that, right? There are tons of programs, there are tons of curriculum online, but many students go home and don't have access to the internet, don't have access to yeah. technology. And like, especially in rural communities, that is a huge problem where students are traveling like hours on a school bus every day and missing like really quality time that they could be like doing schoolwork, learning, having access to a bunch of different skill sets. 
Um, and so we started a program called Rolling Study Halls, and this is where we equip school buses with Wi-Fi devices and educators. Um, the idea is that as students are commuting, sometimes hours, both ways, they can use that time to still be learning. And we started with a pilot in North Carolina and South Carolina. It was so successful. We saw really great changes in math and reading. Um, scores. We also saw like increased digital fluency because they're kind of interacting with technology on their ride to school, um, and we're expanding that um, this year to so, 60 more school districts. So Wi-Fi connected rolling school buses. Yeah. that's amazing. So, and I'm sure your team is working with you know um, school administrations to yeah. make that happen. So again, back to our opening. It takes this collaboration. Right. And, and understanding what the gaps are in the yeah. community is like actually being there and seeing what's happening. Like everyone's for a while was just like, oh, technology in the classroom is going to change everything, right? But we didn't think like, yeah, so the school has internet and they may have computers there, but what happens when all your homework is online but you have no <laughs> access to the internet? Right. Right. So we need to like be in communities learning these things, right? And be coming up with creative solutions. That's awesome. So glad to hear those stories. Tyra, let's talk about New America. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure everyone in the room knows who New America is, so can you tell us um, about the organization and what your mission is? Yes, so we are a civic platform and think of ourselves traditionally or historically known as a think tank. And we feel like a think tank is closed and it's insular, so we're describing ourselves as a new kind of think tank or a civic platform where you can imagine a media platform and a research lab and a tech lab all combined together where our folks do research and writing, but also action work on the ground in local communities around the country, solving some of the problems that we're talking about today uh, to really come up with innovative ideas that, that we think are necessary to solve public problems. And so our work uh, in particular connects to this conversation, both because we have a huge national, what we call partnership, uh, to advance youth apprenticeships, so thinking about how we both expand, use apprenticeships as an equity tool. So rec it, apprenticeships right now, if you don't know, are largely white and male, and they're not very young. The average age is 30. And we think that apprenticeships have an opportunity to be an equity play to give students at the high school level relevant curriculum and give them this entryway into the workforce while also earning the credentials. So that's one piece, and we're uh, investing in communities around the country to think about how we can expand and make relevant the apprenticeships today. And then the second piece of work that we're doing on the ground in communities is related to the future of work and what we call work workers in technology of thinking about shift labs. Yeah. And so in the context of shift labs, we are working with communities to understand what their highest risks of our automation are. So. Hiring is very local. We often have these conversations around AI and jobs like way up at the 50,000 foot level, except hiring, Walmart, right, hires at the very local level. IBM hires at the very local level. So what we're doing is bringing local data to communities to understand what the highest risks of automation are, and then helping this cross-section of stakeholders who sometimes, surprisingly and not surprisingly, have not gotten together before where you think about um, local community council members, with educators, with workforce boards, with employers, to say what is our local response to our highest risk of automation? What do we do about that? How do, how do we reallocate dollars? How do we reallocate our energy towards responding to that and then helping them move forward with putting that, that play into action? Great, so can you give us an example of where a shift lab is currently active? and how it came to be and exactly how it's rolling out, you know, how, how you guys are brainstorming and ideating yeah. this, this problem. So uh, we've done a number of them around the country. I'll use, uh, let's say, I'll say Phoenix uh, as an example. So imagine we get together for a day with all the folks that I talked about. We bring the local data and say, what particular jobs are at high, highest risk of automation? Often, we think about it for some reason as like truck drivers and men, but it's actually not that. Some of the biggest jobs at risk for automation are impacting women mm -hmm. uh, and people of color. So we give them that local data, and then we sort of imagine what the life of 
we literally kind of have the teams come up with these, imagine a profile of a person, so a middle age, you know, black woman with one kid, and so each group has a set of folks, and then they imagine what the, what some key trajectory moments in this individual's life that might allow them from going, un, you know, maybe a job, unemployed, struggling because their job has been automated, and what are some of those key inflection points, mm -hmm. and then come up with a set of big ideas. So in the case of Phoenix, and you could say, is that a big idea, but it, it kind of is, where they said, ah, our workforce dollars should be channeled. Sure. To, to these particular categories of people. So rather than us thinking about upskilling in general, which has value, mm -hmm. let us think about how we shift dollars. So some very, very tactical and real kind of strategies and solutions that folks get together to say, we're gonna start to do things differently across the board and we that was I love it that was the idea that came up in I, phoenix in particular i love it so I, what i'm hearing is you're creating these personas of people at risk yes and then coming up with an action plan to say here's how to help them transition yes I think so it's fantastic. been revamping workforce boards it's been looking at the curriculum at the community college level it's been trainings all of those things to to find those intervention points for those various personas. And do you have a partnership with Walmart at this time? We do have okay, a Okay, can you tell me a little Walmart. bit about that? <laughs> and if you can tell us a little bit about that, and then we're gonna chat with Sean a little bit. Yeah, so, uh, and Sean can expand. It's shameless, selfless plug, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> so I we- that from Walmart. <laughs> we had been more in metro communities with the shift labs that we've, we've okay. done, and we are shifting to expand to rural communities. And so we call them rural shift labs. We'll, we'll be focused in southern Indiana, surprise Bentonville, Arkansas, and awesome. West Virginia as part of that. And the reason is we tend to spend all of our energy on Silicon Valley and Austin and Chicago. And those are places where you also see vast inequities, where those communities are thriving, but then there are pockets of communities like people of color, for example, that are being left out. But then there's also this huge swath of the country, the number's like 60%, who are not in those dense metro right. communities and who have a different set of challenges and opportunities. They're smaller, there's a better sense of community, you can get your arms around it, but sometimes they're also desperate. So we feel like there's some real assets in those communities that can be leveraged yep. as we think about work. And so we're expanding the work that I've described of shift labs on the ground to extend into rural communities to help the communities. Part of what we often do is we tell to communities what they should be doing and we don't bring them into the fold. Okay. So this is bringing them into the fold and we're excited to partner with Walmart to, to do that in a number of rural communities around the country. That's terrific. We cannot forget about all of our states and all the different rural areas um, that have definitely sometimes felt left behind, that they don't have job opportunities in high-skilled um, digital tech roles. Um, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to talk to Walmart now. We're going to talk to Sean. Um, I'm going to put in a plug for their recent report that they did with Thank McKinsey you. called America at Work. And I'm going to ask Sean to describe it. Um, this is phenomenal. He's got a few copies downstairs if any of you want them, and they're also online. Mm -hmm. um, but so instead of me describing it, because I'm a big fan, you can see I have my notes in it. Um, can you tell us about the America at Work study? Sure. And why Walmart took the opportunity to, to conduct this research? Yeah, ha happy to. Um, as, as as Tyra mentioned, you know we we have been looking at this issue around the future of work, and we have been um, you know sort of consuming and 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 reviewing uh, the studies and the reports that were out there. And they all had they they have a lot of great things to say. But one of the things that we thought wasn't really being talked about was um, the the impact of the future of work on places that are outside of major urban areas. Um, a lot of the research is focused kind of big picture, nationally, globally. Will there or, won't be, will there or won't there be jobs? Um, but we thought uh, that, that 
one of the things we could potentially add to this discussion was looking at the potential impact across the entire country. And in order to do that, we had to look a little bit further uh, and, and, and look at data at as local a level as we could while still including places that are maybe in unincorporated areas and things like that. So we looked at county level data. Um, we looked at about 60, we, we used about 60 different data sources and we used about 600 different data points and we put together what we called sort of our resiliency index and that's really what the report is, is attempting to do is assess whether communities have the assets and the capacity to respond to the changes that are coming with the future of work and not necessarily although inclusive of the workforce discussion but what other related areas uh, are, are in need of attention based on um, essentially how the numbers stack up for each uh, of, of the of the communities that we looked at um, so we ended up um, clustering uh, the counties around the country uh, basically we did a we ran a model where we were comparing every county's data against every other county's data and as things started to stick together we ended up with these um, eight, eight clusters which we ended up calling community archetypes and the interesting thing about it is um, rather than sort of an urban suburban rural uh, 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 typical understanding, we actually ended up with about eight archetypes. Um, and they still stretch across the urban-rural continuum, but the interesting thing is that uh, rural America actually breaks down into five of these uh, archetypes. And they, the, the assets and the capacity that, that each one of those communities has is a little bit different based on where they sit and, and based on historically on whether they've been able to weather previous changes in the workforce and so um, ultimately we you know our 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 findings were were fairly simple and straightforward but we think they're powerful too is that the future of work isn't a dichotomy of just urban and rural um, we're incredibly diver diverse and we have a lot of different strengths and challenges like i said um, as tyra mentioned 60 percent of the u.s population falls outside of the urban archetypes that we put together are suburban archetypes. Um, as, as, as you mentioned, Jennifer, community level collaboration is going to be key. It needs to be cross sector. It mm -hmm. needs to be public and private. Um, it, needs to be, it, it needs to be well tailored to the community, which makes everything just more complicated. Um, but nevertheless, like if the right people are working together as, as they do, like when the shift labs uh, uh, deploy, then, then I think we'll be able to solve this. And we came up with six principal uh, responses, which are basically sort of like buckets of uh, interventions that, that uh, communities can take. We tried not to be overly prescriptive, because mm -hmm. uh, as we said, like every community is going to be a little bit different, and this isn't meant to be uh, us talking at communities. We, we very much want this to start a conversation with communities mm -hmm. about these issues. And so um, looking at retraining and upskilling, yeah. Um, uh, strengthening education, these things are not surprising. Um, boosting mobility within the labor market. Um, building and maintaining infrastructure is really key, especially if you're, if you're just sort of outside of the reach of additional opportunities, whether it's education or work. Um, being able to make sure that we're looking at transportation infrastructure the right way. Or if you're in really remote areas, then digital infrastructure and things like broadband access. I mean, and these are things that have been highlighted in, in, in other reports, but we wanted to collect it under this framework of these eight archetypes and, and how the country, uh, we think, truly looks with respect to uh, the resiliency against mm -hmm. the future of work. So um, as you mentioned, um, the report's online. Um, we have it at walmart.com slash American Life. Um, you can download the report, and there's a brief summary there. We also created, uh, because this, this is only 40 pages and there's 3,113 counties around the United States, is that people may be interested in learning more about uh, where they're working or worry, uh, looking at the state uh, that they serve if they're working for a legislator or a governor. Um, and we've created this interactive map uh, uh, on, a, on a Tableau page that you can get to from that same URL. And um, you can click and compare different counties. You can look at each one of the archetypes and get a brief description on them. Um, but we're hoping that that's a tool that sort of helps the report come alive and can, can also be uh, added insight. And you can even print off reports if you want of the, of the different mm -hmm. data points and how they stack up. So we, 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 we hope that this keeps this conversation going. And we hope that this can be an added tool uh, to, to, to programs like Shift Labs and other things so yep. that we can better understand some of the communities around us. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just to show you visually, I, don't, I mean, here's the map of the United States, and 
there's different color codes for these eight archetypes. And, you know, it'll show you that Northern Michigan has more in common with like Southwest areas of Texas than it does South East Michigan. Um, and so these um, eight archetypes are really fantastic. So if you, based on where you're working or if you are doing work in a certain area, you can really hone in on that community and understand what their labor market looks like and what kind of assessment they got in terms of how resilient they can be in, in responding to automation. Just to give you a flavor of some of the names, um, one is called urban centers and core suburbs smaller independent economies that tends to be like i live in virginia so the western part of the state um, distressed americana the rust belt areas um, great escapes this was really small but um, kind of out in areas where our national parks are right I yeah think i remember it, that it, so, it, so it was only they have 13, a different type of yeah. economy around travel and hospitality it was only a handful of counties but they they separated uh as we did the data analysis and it's interesting it's your it's your Vales, it's your Nantuckets, it's yeah. places, <laughs> places where people have conferences to talk about the future of That's work. Right. <laughs> so, exactly. yeah. so, you know, different jobs in, in different areas. So um, just a really places. great report. Very phenomenal places. It's, it's really cool. And you can, through the interactive um, piece online, you can hone in on where you live or where you grew up. So um, great. A couple more questions for Walmart. Um, tell us about your dollar a day tuition program and um, you know why you did that to you know sure. invest in your current workers. Yeah. So we've um, over the last four years we've been investing really heavily in our workforce. We we kicked that off in um, in 2015 and in 2016 we started building these in-house training academies. Um, that provide a work-based learning experience for people that are going into leadership roles and continuing to move up the leadership ladder within the stores. Um, and as we were talking uh, to those folks and to, uh, and to our frontline associates about uh, things that uh, c c can help them uh, develop their careers, education we heard time and time again. Um, specifically college education, uh, even from um, associates who had, uh, had never connected to college, um, maybe don't even have their high school degree yet, and then also uh, people who had become ta detached from the education experience uh, at, at some point or another. Um, so what we wanted to, and, and we heard a lot that the reasons for, uh, for, for disconnecting from the education system and from, from not pursuing that further uh, was, a, was a range of things, but one of the central themes was around um, accumulating debt and being able to devote the time mm -hmm. uh, to a course of study while you're also working. So our working learners um, needed a solution that allowed them to pursue education, um, but also gave them an, an opportunity to do so in a way that, that fit their lifestyle and their responsibilities. So we worked with, um, with a startup uh, out of Denver called Guild, um, and we uh, last year uh, announced that we would be uh, providing um, to all U.S. associates, uh, including Sam's Club, including our e-commerce folks, the ability to pursue um, uh, associates and bachelor's degrees in a couple key fields um, that, that we knew were in demand for us and we knew uh, that would be uh, wor worthwhile for our associates to pursue uh, whether they wanted to continue a career within Walmart or continue a career elsewhere. Um, and those were, uh, the, the initial offering includes business uh, management and supply chain uh, degrees. Okay, um, so where you have high demand. And exactly, yep. and, and, so, and so we partnered with uh, we partnered with three schools. The University of Florida is the, the one you'll likely know. Um, in addition, Bellevue and Brandeman universities, they're both, um, they're both distance learning universities, fully accredited, and they actually cater to working learners. They actually, they actually started by um, offering education programs to military as they're okay. you know, traveling around and stuff. So that's, that's where they built uh, and developed their muscle there. And so we've worked with them to develop curriculum <laughs> that uh, is, is not only academically robust, but also has relevancy to our business. Um, using you know Walmart related case studies in the business course for example um, and then for for those academies uh, uh, graduates people who have completed our academies programs um, we actually worked with these uh, universities and with guild to create uh, portable college credit okay. so completing academies uh, courses can can earn you up to I think 20 it may be higher now 20 or 22 hours of college credit based on the, your experience in that role. So um, we are covering the cost of tuition, books, and fees. 
um, uh, outside of Pell eligibility, and we're asking for associates to put a little bit of skin in the game, is, mm -hmm. this, is the slang that we use for it. Uh, to I should have my kids put some skin in the game. <laughs> to, commit, um, <laughs> to commit a dollar a day yeah, um, that's good. Over, over the course of, uh, of the year, the equivalent to a dollar a day. Yeah. So, um, so far, we've got uh, 4,000 associates that have been either accepted or attending uh, courses at those universities. Um, we also have a program called College Start, which Guild uh, helps facilitate, which is helping people who maybe have the high school diploma but can't, uh, aren't, aren't ready for college yet. And we have about 3,000 people in that okay. program. And we also have seen a spike in our high school uh, equivalency offering, which we had, for, which we had, had previously. Um, but we have about 3,000 people uh, pursuing that right now, too. So it's, we're, we're, um, wherever you kind of fall in that spectrum, we're trying to offer an opportunity for you to, to, to get all the way through. And I love the stories I see on social media where you show, like I saw one last week of an associate that's now a buyer and, and you know, sorry, and the growth um, that you've, you've uh, given to your associates over the years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, We're trying stories. to connect them to their next career, yeah. you know, where, where they want to go on the career ladder. And at Walmart, there's a ton of different roles that you can do, whether you're in the store or not. So That's right. Tyra, did you want to say anything? Oh, OK. All right, so before we get to questions, I just want to toss out a few of random questions. So I'm going to start with you, Tyra. Um, do you think it's important that um, we talk about the role, the, talk about l the importance of lifelong learning? And what does it mean to you? I do think it's important. And lifelong learning, to me, is constantly evolving in one's interest and skills and understanding kind of the way that the world is going, what's happening in the world, and what your contributions can be to it. And I often think about it as the intersection of passion, skill, and desire, and need of the market itself, where those things come together. We do live in a changing world. Jobs are changing. I do uh, fundamentally believe what we haven't talked about is AI has not been able to rep replicate creativity. Uh, as part of this, and so as we think about the knowledge economy, their creativity plays a critical role as part of that. But yes, absolutely, they are. Those things are critical um, for for just our our. I won't say viability, but just sort of um, sustainability uh, within the within the world. Kate, I have a question for you. And that is, how do you do? You ever get the uh, question? Um, you know, automation and technology is displacing jobs and that, you know, tech is bad. Do you ever get questions like that? And if so, how do you respond? Yeah, I think that there is a lot of fear, fear specifically around automation and robots and what it means. I think that there's more work to be done, and, and New America is doing a lot of this, of seeing like how automation is actually going to change jobs and like which communities are going to face the biggest challenges in that area. Um, but I often think like the conversation is just like too binary. It's like all the jobs are going to go away. It's like we all have to be afraid, or like everything's going to be fine, and we don't need to do anything. Like it's going to be a great technological future, and we just should let it happen. And I think the work that we're trying to do at Google is this kind of middle space, right? There are some jobs that are going to change because of AI and automation. Um, but we also think that technology has a great opportunity for communities. And so we want to make sure that technology is helping everyone reach those opportunities. And like Walmart, we released our own report last year in this space. It's called Opportunity for Everyone. And we released it at another fancy Future of Work <laughs> Aspen Ideas Festival. Um, that really resonated with me. Um, and in that, we talk about our programs and philanthropy that we're doing at Google. But we also talk about the role of public policy in this space and what we can look at to change our social safety nets, our programs for workers, our education and skilling opportunities to make things easier for people in a transition and also help them get into the high quality fulfilling jobs they're looking for right now. Right. Kelly, I have a random question for you. OK. Um, we, we keep hearing that the skills that, that our K through 12 students need to focus on are critical thinking skills and problem solving and soft skills. What are your thoughts on that? And what would you say to teachers you know, in K through 12? What should they focus on? What should they teach their students, regardless of the subject? I do think those are some of the skills that we need to be talking about. As technology skills sort of ebb and flow, those are the skills that are going to carry somebody through. 
Um, and I think you can really teach those in an educational environment. You can teach collaboration. You can teach how to give good feedback, how to receive good feedback, how to think creatively, how to have a growth mindset and handle problems. Um, Kate, you talked a little bit about data literacy. That, that is a, a big focus area. Um, and really just that understanding of technology. Not everybody has to be a coder, but to feel comfortable with technology and how you're using it in your life and how you could use it to change how you approach a problem. So. And Sean, one last question for you. Sure. Um, does Walmart talk about the importance of soft skills and how do you train them and are you using technology to better educate your associates on how to respond to situations, yeah. whether they're in the store or outside of the store? Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, given that so many roles are, are, are customer facing, and even roles that aren't, you, you, we all have customers. We all have um, the the need to develop those skills, and not just uh, you know. We, we mentioned collaboration. We mentioned um, creative thinking. Empathy is another uh, big thing uh, that we that we teach from. Um, from onboarding on. Um, and one of the things that we're doing through the academies is trying to facilitate some of that empathy training um, through the use of virtual reality. Um, we're using VR for, for other training modules as well, uh, including a couple that, you'll, that you'll, you can see downstairs uh, at lunchtime. We'll have some demos running. But also, because um, I think they have specific ones that they have uh, uh, teed up for downstairs, but there's also uh, these uh, modules that allow you to, as a manager, be in front of an associate and uh, be working through a development opportunity with them, or um, at, at working at a uh, register and dealing with a customer who is paying with change. Um, you know, wow, that's under, yeah. under, understanding your customer and understanding um, what you know, what, what might be leading to that situation and understanding and being patient with mm -hmm. them. And, you know, those skills obviously are necessary to serve our customers well, but these are things that you can take into any role that you had. I, I worked at a grocery store for eight years between high school and college, mm -hmm. and it, it wasn't Walmart, but it was, <laughs> it, it was an, an incredible experience that I still, you know, call back to yeah. all the time. It's, it's something that can set people up for a number of different fields, or it can set you up for moving, yeah. moving up in retail as well. Right. So. That's incredible. All right, we have a few minutes um, if we want to take some questions from the floor. So. Thanks, guys, for a great discussion. Um, one of the things that we haven't talked about today, um, and one of the biggest labor trends that are going on is the idea of the contingent or contractor workforce. Um, and I think that's got really interesting implications when you think about what that means for the mobi mobility of work and the incentive of companies to spend a lot of time reskilling and educating and training their workforces. Um, I'd be really interested just to understand how you guys think about that kind of dichotomy of incentives. All right, can I, I'm going to restate what I heard. So what I heard you say was that what is the role that a contingent or contracted worker can, can play? I, I, I didn't understand the question, sorry. Did the guys on the panel understand okay. the question maybe before I rephrase it? Yeah, I, I, okay, you're, I you're talking about the incentives for like full-time employees versus contractors and investments in learning programs. Yeah, if more of your staff are gonna be more mobile and oh. they're gonna stick around for a longer period of time, how does that change the incentive to invest in training where for the last few decades people have stuck around for decades? Um, and therefore the company's ROI have been a lot higher against that training. Yeah, I think, I think this question is a big one. There's a lot of conversations in Washington, at least, about um, what are the incentives to get companies to invest in learning programs for all types of workers. I think there are, you know, you can see on this panel, there are a lot of companies who are doing that type of work. But it's, it's not just about focusing on like your own workforce, right, and the skills like that we need in computer scientists, but we're trying to do this more broadly, right? We're looking at like what makes the training program successful, like how can people afford them? Should we change our financial aid system so that more workers can get into training programs? Um, can we look at like social safety nets that are going to help people be able to kind of reinvest in skilling when they need to? Um, and I think those are things that kind of apply across the board. Um, yeah, like if a, if a person is going to, we talked about loyalty in IBM's apprenticeship program, I'm sure that drives a lot of their work, but really also it is finding these passionate, 
talented people, right, and helping them be successful. And for us, we want them to, of course, stay at Google, but also if they can transfer those skills and credentials elsewhere, I think that helps the overall economy. And it's, it's certainly a trend that you're seeing uh, a, a lot of. I mean, f from from our perspective, I mean, we have more than a million uh, uh, workers, uh, employees uh, uh, that that work in the U.S. And you know, we we know that we're still going to have a large number of employee uh, associates that are working for us. So that's, I mean, that was the impetus for for in investing four billion dollars over the last four years and in training and education, but also in the physical facilities. Like we created 200 classroom settings um, around high performing stores around the United States. And that is that is where the academy's curriculum is, is delivered and offered. So we've, we've, made a, we've made a big bet on our employee workforce. And, and obviously, you know, it, uh, contracting work, gig work, those types of things are, are on the rise. And I think one of the things that, whether you're an employer or whether you're a platform or whatever, I think you know, making sure that you're looking ahead and and looking at making sure that those opportunities continue to exist for the flexibility that they offer, but also look at how that flexibility can also affect stability. Like, do we need to look at modernizing the social safety net? Do we need to look at those types of things? Do we need to do something to blur this, this bright line between contracting and the employee uh, uh, model so that people can you know, be equipped for what they need to be able to, to be mobile and to continue to build whatever, whatever it is that they want to do with the work that they're doing. And if I could add just two quick thoughts on that. One is I think there's opportunity for collective action. What I saw working on an initiative called Tech Hire, which was about expanding pathways to jobs, is employers got together and said, we're having trouble filling X jobs. So when you have multiple employers get together to make that investment, then you're sort of sharing the cost uh, and the downsides of making that investment. So I think if we have more collective action, it can help butt against that tension. And then second, I think there's, it's similar to what we were talking about for apprenticeships, is that I also find when you tend to invest in people, they tend to stick around. Mm -hmm. So there are some jobs that they're highly mobile and companies should look at their culture that make people want to be highly mobile, so let's not lose sight of that. But the second thing is, I find with the apprenticeships and other opportunities where you expand the pool and you invest in people, there's a sense of loyalty and so there's a more stickiness that gets created when those investments and, and we should not lose sight of that. Go ahead. A, a couple of things. One, I want to give a shout out to Kelly. I'm not a plant, but I'm a former technology, computer science grad and technology worker who's now with the state of West Virginia. So in our Department of Commerce, our group has worked with the IBM Rocket Center location on internships, and it's been nationally seen. So, uh, you know, we're eager for that to continue. We've got things like uh, we call learn and earn where you will we'll pay for 50% of someone's salary for a year if someone gives them an internship and $2,000 per, per year per employee for ongoing training because we're trying to, I, I joke that I'm working on things that don't burn. But anyhow, so the, the question for the panel is, Educators want to do what is being discussed here, whether it be at the college and technical community level, K through 12, four-year universities, but the vast majority that I've run into don't have the first clue about building a pathway, whether it be a Cisco certification in your senior year of high school, should I teach Swift, should I teach Python, JavaScript, Go, because in so they're all over the place. Is there, what are your thoughts about on having defined pathways that say, if you're in high school, you can get this skill and get a job and then re-enter a pathway at a two-year school or a four-year school? Is there any work being done on trying to solidify a common pathway for people who don't understand technology? One of the things that we're looking at is how 
search can play a role in this space. So we launched in 2017 job search. So if you go to Google and you type in, like, I'm looking for a job in retail in my area, you can find open job listings, right? And so that was allowing people to be like, OK, this is my skill set, and this is a job I'm looking for, and find it more easily, rather than like searching all around the various places that like jobs are housed these days. Um, what we're doing now is trying to expand that to also include skilling and learning programs so that someone can kind of both look for jobs in their areas and find um, these potential programs that they may be interested to help them get to the job that they want that maybe they, they don't have the skills for. Um, we're piloting it with the state of Virginia and with Goodwill, and so that should be coming out more soon. But the goal is to have more access to the information that you're talking about, right? Like, what skills, what certifications do jobs require? Do they actually require a bachelor's degree or not? And giving that information to the individuals who are looking for them at the time that they're looking. Yeah. I'd say thank you for calling out West Virginia. I think that's a great example of a lot of what was discussed today. It's a rural location great partnerships between industry, between the, the college system, between the workforce system, um, and our apprentices are doing fantastic there. Um, so on your question, I, there's kind of two pieces. I don't really think about careers as a straight trajectory anymore, which probably becomes a little bit of a problem when you try to apply that to an educational construct. Um, so one of the things that I think has been very valuable is the program that we launched around digital credentials. And it's open and accessible. You can go out to ibm.com forward slash training, and you can take different courses. Many of them are free. Um, that you can earn a digital badge. But behind these badges sits a lot of metadata. And if you start to look at what skills you will learn by attaining a particular badge, you can start to connect that to the types of jobs that would use that. Um, and so we're starting to see, I think, a lot broader adoption of that. It, it's very much aligned, I think, with the way you're approaching skill and search. But um, that partnership, back to that topic, is, is what is so important there. Um, with Allegheny College of Maryland, we've worked with them on a cybersecurity program. And so we bring in interns, we bring in apprentices through that program. Another great example was a need that we identified in Raleigh, North Carolina around blockchain. Nobody's teaching blockchain. Um, so we worked with Wake Tech and actually created a blockchain capstone course uh, that their students can go through. They're actually building um, a course registration system using Hyperledger, and they're getting mentored by IBMers. So they're seeing and understanding how they can take these skills and actually connect it to something in the workforce. One, one just final thing to add based on what you said. I think one thing that we could all be doing better is like there are tons of programs and pilots and tests sharing what we learned from those experiences. Like what made them successful? What made them be able to scale or not scale? And actually even talking about the things that didn't work, right? Things that we tried that didn't work. I don't think we do it enough. We all get on these panels and we talk about our great programs and pilots and like, yes, like we're, we're doing wonderful work and it's really important that like so many people are at the table, but we also need to do a better job of talking about the learnings, talking about the failures, and trying to see how, how these things can scale to different communities. Great. Well, I think we're out of time, right? OK. So um, thank you, Tyra, Kate, Sean, and Kelly. Great discussion. And I know we're going to keep having it. <laughs>